So, all right, we have, good, we have about 15 minutes left and that's good for me to introduce statistical testing and then we can definitely go do a statistical test um, for Tuesday and like um, build up that part of the statistical power, um, effect size and all that stuff. So let's go, I'm checking my lesson to make sure I get through all my stuff, hypothesis testing. So now we can build up this confidence interval, we can do a sample, now we can say, all right, we want to do something called hypothesis test. So give me a thumbs up if someone, um, if you guys are familiar with hypothesis testing, like maybe from your background or something like that. Give me kind of sideways, you're like, maybe I heard about it, but like, I'm like, ah, I don't really like know what to do. Okay, get some sideways. And thumbs down, you're like, hypothesis testing. Ah, again, I have no clue. Awesome. So at least you guys all have heard about this, which is good. Um, so one thing to talk about before you even talk about hypothesis test is what is a good experiment? And I'll go through this really, really quickly, is that the main thing of, is experimental design. If you do not have good data, there is nothing, well, I shouldn't say there's nothing, but it's going to be a lot harder to get reasoning out of it. If your data are biased, like for example, if you only ask people, you know, that you know, or something along those lines, then it's going to be hard to determine things for the whole population. You can tell things about that subpopulation, right? But for the whole population, you have to be aware of that. So it's good to know how good experimental design. So one is um, making sure your data comes from the scientific method. Um, if it's following the scientific method, so a lot of like technical data and stuff like this can be really useful. Um, and this is a lot of like survey data, for example. Um, making sure you know where your data came from versus just being like, oh, there's data, does this go for it? You have to be familiar, like how was this collected? Um, I won't go through all the scientific method, but you guys can look that up, it's pretty easy. Um, for the record, there is no official like scientific method that all scientists follow. Um, but in general, basically there's this part. Okay, making a good experiment, make sure your experiment's not biased, make sure you have it um, as best you can, like um, that it's going to be able to actually answer a question and it's reproducible, right? Um, that's kind of an important part. So knowing your data, because you can you can make data without having a good experiment, if that makes sense. Um, so just kind of be aware of this. Control groups. So making sure basically you have something to compare with the baseline. Usually for data science, that usually means looking at the full population as best you can, or something that represents the full population, and then looking at a specific group um, of that subset. So you want to make sure you have an idea of what your control group is before you look at your subgroup. So for example, um, if you are talking about, I'm just going to say ages, because we've been talking about this. You're talking about the whole ages of the population or whatever. If you want to know if the average age is different for, let's say, um, someone living in Canada versus the US, right? Your US could be like your control or Canada could be control, or you can say the world population is your control. So the thing is you want to say, what's your baseline to compare it with, okay? Uh, random trials, this is where we talked about stratified uh, sampling last time, right? Um, but random trials um, usually is the gold, like pretty gold standard of being like, if you can do randomized controlled st uh, studies, so you hear um, ran randomly controlled, right? So random controlled studies um, allow you to basically make sure you have a large, um, like you are not introducing bias. Sometimes it makes sense to do stratified samples, but in general, um, those are actually also can be really difficult to perform well and making sure you catch every single group. So random usually ends up being cheaper in the way of like you're trying to proceed it. But sometimes, honestly, it could also be really expensive. So just know that this tends to be the best way to kind of do your experiment. Uh, sample size, basically make sure you have enough people. Like we talked about having 15 people, 50 people, 1,000 people. The bigger sample size, the better, usually in data science we try to collect a lot of data, um, but sometimes that data is just not available. So just be aware. And like I said, reproducible. So make sure that it's something that you can actually test again. Um, if you have something based on an event, you can say things that had happened, but it's gonna be hard to make sure that was actually related to the event. So there might be a, cause, a correlation versus a causation, okay? Um, last thing, I just have some fine good examples. Like, I think that's just a good thing to do. Um, I particularly really like this healthcare triage. Has anyone know healthcare triage on YouTube? I don't expect you guys to because it is not really well known. I like to tell people about it and say, it's, you, it's a YouTube channel that talks about a lot of healthcare stuff for people who really like numbers. And like, it's a, this show would never exist like on TV because it's like kind of boring in some ways. Um, but uh, the person who does it, um, Aaron Carroll, I think it's a like really data driven um, doctor and they really talk about it's like, hey, like what is it realistically? So one thing they talk about is like, you know, cap, cap 
uh, coffee. Is coffee really bad for you? Is caffeine really bad for you? And they go through meta-analyses and he talks about this. And he actually has a few things about, you know, um, data and stuff in general. And I think he does a really great job and does work really well. And he builds, um, I, if you want to see someone say, hey, here are data, here are results, but how do I interpret this? This person, in my opinion, does a really great job of doing that. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'll share this out right in Slack, or not Slack, uh, Zoom right now, since you guys are all here. But as always, this is in the repos um, in there. Okay, so cool. Experiment design. Let's talk about hypothesis. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Jessica. I just have a question. Mm -hmm. When, not to like throw off the train of thought here, but when would bootstrapping be used? Like, is that used or is it just something that can be used? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, usually, to be honest, usually we talk about bootstrapping versus like, like Jackknife in particular. Um, it's because of computational efficiencies. But bootstrap basically is a technique of saying you're sampling over a sample. So one way you can do this is actually generating data. So you can generate new data from the sample that you already have, and you can bootstrap it basically and create more data than you had previously. Um, other times it can be other things like, for example, using the central limit theorem. So it's more of like a general technique, um, and it just depends on like what you're trying to do. So one example, which I think is in the appendix, I actually don't know if it's in the appendix in this module, uh, Monte Carlo simulations. Um, you can use bootstrapping techniques to basically build up um, a simulation without having to simulate every single little thing. You can simulate only po a portion of it and it saves you a lot of extra, well, if you're doing simulations, compu computational time and resources. Um, but it can also mean that you can thrive information from it like we saw with the central limit theorem and confidence intervals. That makes sense? So it's something that does have like real world application in data science. It's something mm -hmm. that data scientists like apply and use yeah you will see this in statistical learning um a lot of times to be quite honest bootstrap is like the the person holding up the the thing that like everyone pays attention to but like they're the real thing that's like holding it up um that's kind of what bootstrap is it's you should think of it more like a technique um of like how to pull up more random samples okay cool, cool. thanks yeah good question though it's always good to know like what is it the practical applications but you saw it's relatively simple it's basically just sampling over a sample that you already have yeah it's, it makes sense it's really simple but yeah i was just wondering about like application like when would we use that versus actually having data because we i feel like the idea is we want as many actual samples as possible mm -hmm. so when would we like not have as many yeah as as, like a small amount? so I will tell you a few examples real quick, um, which I think is important. And then we'll go right into this because um, I think it's one thing like about data generation. So one is that if you have not very much data, right, you can definitely build this up. But also it accounts for if you have a huge amount of data, but it's not represent like you essentially need more. So for example, self-driving cars, um, when they have this data, for example, they can drive a huge amount of miles, but they're not going to see every single little thing. And then also making sure like, you know, how do you make sure you account for other things that happen? You can use Bootstrap to kind of artificially make your data sample larger and then add extra fuzz with that Bootstrap sample. So you basically can create new um, like data from something that you originally didn't have. Um, and I think I saw a little quick chat here. Um, see a lot of medical researchers have small sample size overall seems like you could rely on bootstrapping. You do have to be careful with bootstrapping um, like for something like this because you do technically are biased by the sample but you can still determine a lot of extra things and you have to be aware of like what your population already looks like. So I, I will say it's if you look in the statistical literature you can see like where bootstrapping has certain properties for the standard deviation and the mean and stuff like this um, versus like jackknife and other techniques. So you always have to kind of be aware of this kind of stuff. Um, but I don't know if this kind of answers the question. But. Yeah, it's, it's helpful in building more of like how it might be used or why. So mm -hmm. yeah, thank okay. you. No problem. Um, yeah, funny enough, if I'll maybe share this yeah, I'm, I'm going my train of thought. If you look up jackknife versus bootstrap, there's actually an article or a little paper that comes up. And it's funny enough is that it actually used to be my professor from um, UC Santa Cruz. Um, he does a great explanation. It's very technical. It's also like the mathematics, but um, it does a really great job. So maybe I'll share that out on Slack um, later and stuff like that. But okay, good thing. I'll move on because we have a few more minutes left or 
you know, like three more minutes left, but that's okay. We can introduce hypothesis test. 